Welcome to the Renaissance and welcome to The Enemy Within, a reply, part 1. And a very important notice to you, our dear viewer, that it is never our intention to offend anyone with our videos. It is not also our intention to suggest, insinuate or preach hate towards any group, race, tribe or person. There is also no propaganda or any deliberate attempt to misinform anyone. The goal of this video is for you to look for the books, journals, magazines or other publications referenced and study them yourself. Remember, it is well known that Negroes of all ages have been in the practice of selling their own children when pressed by want, as they now do nearly all over Africa who also enslaved myriads of their own people by force, Josiah Priest, 1852. And from Ibn Khaldun, therefore, the Negro nation are, as a rule, submissive to slavery, because Negroes have little that is essentially human and have attributes that are quite similar to those of dumb animals, as we have stated, and that's an Arab scholar. And for lack of a better title, because we are not subject matter experts, we titled this video The Enemy Within, but not necessarily the Fulanese this time, but the entire enemies within, including conditioned Negroes. But if you recall from part 1 and 2 of Fulani The Enemy Within reply videos, we also responded to the video by the home team African team which sought to make the victims, that's the Negroes, same as the oppressors, that's the non-Negroes. And again, there was that subtle way of alleging that the victims were behind the hunt, raid and capture of the slaves, which we know is not true and is actually impossible. And we showed that the Fulanese did not sell fellow Fulanese. And of course, we looked at the case of Job Ben Solomon, who was a uh, rescued from slavery and returned back to his native country. And in one of those videos, we got a comment that says, Teacher, please who are the Jews described on there that weren't raided with the Fulani? And another comment there says, So are the black Fulani the offsprings of the conquering of the Hausa? So please remember that Hausas are not Negroes. They are Negroid or Hamitic, but certainly not Negroes. The Fulanis are Babas. So these are two different things. The Negroes are totally different. So the dark Fulanese are not products of their conquest of Hausa, but rather products of Fulanese and the Negro slave women. That's ideally how it played out. The same thing you see in the Indian and Aboriginal areas where the product of the slave master, the Indian slave master and the Negro slave woman gave rise to the dark Indians. The only difference is that their hair is usually not as woolly as that of the Negroes or as straight as that of the Indians. And to the question about the Jews that were not being sold, in as much as we are unable to answer your question because we do not hold any opinions of our own, but what we do is to show you what the books are saying, having realized that the biggest thing they use against the Negroes is that they listen to what they are told. It doesn't matter what is written, it doesn't matter what the experience is, all you need is to tell them the lie you want them to believe. And as far as you tell it as often as possible, then you have their belief and faith in it and they will be defending it. So that is the same thing the enemies within back in Sub-Saharan Africa like the Fulanese, the Babas, the Tuaregs, the Arabs also live region to enslave the Negroes. So. To answer that question or try to present you some facts that will help you answer the question yourself, let us reference Bible Defense of Slavery or the origin, history and fortunes of the Negro race as deduced from history both sacred and profane, their natural relations, moral, mental and physical to the other races of mankind compared and illustrated their future destiny predicted etc by Josiah Priest and this was published in 1851 and it tells us that in the time of St. Paul the term Gentile as in the days of Noah 
see Genesis 10.5, refer to the nations of the white race, as it is written by the apostle in several of his letters to the churches that he was the apostle of the Gentiles. Can it be shown that Paul ever preached to a Negro people at all? If not, then it follows that the word Gentile still referred to white men in his time as to Greeks, Romans, Gauls, Italians, Spaniards, and other nations of the North, but never to the Negro race. So ideally, if we take it that Gentiles mean non-Jews, which is what the definition really should be or is understood to be, then they are telling us who the Gentiles were. But the same Gentiles then are now Jews today and even Gentiles, so they have assumed both sides of the divide, so to say. But going forward to see how the slave master uses his wizardry in writing books and narratives and lying too to justify his actions against the Negroes. Going further, you see where it says, The strangers, therefore, to whom Moses alluded in Leviticus 25.45, were the people of Ham, in all countries, whether Canaan, Egypt, Ethiopia, Libya, or any other country or place inhabited by Negroes. Now, you notice clearly that in that whole list, he never said Africa. Africa was when they remodeled the slavery to something corporate because he never referred to the entire continent before. You need to also remember that they didn't have the continent system previously. Whatever terms they tell you, all you need to do is to look at the old records. You will understand where the slave master is heading to. And it goes further to say, this distinction is made still more clear by St. Luke 21-24 where the power which was finally to destroy Jerusalem is called the Gentiles, who it is well known were the Romans, an empire of white men. This is further proven from the statement of that apostle in Acts 28-28, who while at Rome was a prisoner. In that passage, it is said that as the Jews rejected the gospel, that he should turn to the Gentiles and that they would receive it. Paul was then in the very heart of the Roman or Gentile states, and therefore of necessity proves that the term signified no other race but that of the whites. And going further, it says, Both thy bondmen and thy bondmates, which thou shalt have, shall be of the heathen that are round about, of them shall ye buy, not higher, in bracket, bondmen and bondmates. Moreover, of the children of the strangers, that is, the children of Negroes, foreign to Canaan, who might be dwelling among the Canaanites, that do or may sojourn with you, of them shall you buy, in bracket, children of their families that are with you, which they beget or might beget. In your land, Canaan, after the Jews, should possess it, and they shall be your possession and you shall take them as an inheritance for your children after you to inherit them as a possession they shall be your bondmen forever was this buying the children of the heathen canaanites and using them as bondmen and bondmates or in other words as slaves nothing after all but a privilege granted by moses to the hebrews of hiring them as is pretended by abolitionists in order to get rid of the force of those passages of the law in support of enslaving the Negro race. So remember, they used the Bible extensively, just like the Quran, to justify the slave trade. Just remember that the whole slave trade thing is based on religion. Because everyone knows that all you need to deceive the Negro is tell him that God said. And because the Negroes listen to whatever they are told, then they somehow believe that God could have told someone else who probably had no business with God, never knew God. And that's if we assumed that God actually is the creator of heaven and earth, which we know is not correct. Because if he was, then God, Allah, Jehovah, and all those things would have just been the same. 
there is no way God can be different. So those are just deities, European deities or Arab deities, but certainly not the creator of heaven and earth. So to further provide some thought-provoking points that can help you answer the question of who the Jews were, let us also reference practical system of modern geography or a view of the present state of the world simplified and adapted to the capacity of youth and this was by J. Olney and published 1845 and there we are told that the four prevailing religions of the world are Christian, Mohammedan, Jewish and pagan or heathen. Christians are those who believe in Jesus Christ as the savior of mankind. There are three great divisions of Christians visibly Roman Catholics, Greek Church, and Protestants. And the Roman Catholics are those who acknowledge the supremacy of the Pope, the Greek Church, whatever. But our interest here is the Jews are those who believe in the Old Testament and reject the New and expect a Savior yet to come. And the pagans or heathen are those who believe in false gods and worship idols, beasts, reptiles, etc. Now we ask you, at this time Jews hadn't become anyone other than those who do not believe in the New Testament. But you see how they turned it to a sect and a group and a race of people. Supposedly a race of people who now draw their origin from the book they gave you. Permit us to ask you this very simple question. A man or a woman born at any time T in let's say what was Negro land and Guinea and he or she does not learn to read the slave masters languages be it English, French, Spanish, Dutch or Portuguese. Does it mean without the books and of course Arabic? Does it mean without the books such a person will never be able to worship or commune with the creator of heaven and earth? If your answer is no then these books do not in any way validate the creator of heaven and earth. Let us also reference an American dictionary of the English language intended to exhibit whatever and this was by Noah Wester and in two volumes and it was published in 1828 and there we are shown that gentile means nation, race and is applied to pagans. So the question becomes, if from Josiah Priest in the Bible defense of slavery, we were told that the Gentiles were the white people, that means they were the pagans. But how suddenly did that turn around? Remember we have always told you that they copied part of what they have in their books from the Negro world of life and then claimed it was from the Negro's God. And by God here we simply mean the almighty creator of heaven and earth. Now remember, except in written terms, for example, if you looked at English, there is no difference between false or true God because the only difference is when they do capital G, which doesn't make sense. And the only reason they did not have a unique item or identity or name for the almighty creator of heaven and earth in their languages is because they did not know it and they had no idea what it was. They just saw the Negroes doing it they didn't understand what they were doing but they preferred to usurp the position of the most high that's all they did and then gave the negroes the golden calf so now further down it says in the scriptures a pagan is a worshiper of false gods any person that is not a jew or christian a heathen so you see that their definition of pagan at that time was if as far as you don't follow their Judaism or Christianity and that's by their own definition remember they didn't mention anything like other religions you call today like Buddhism they didn't mention them so that will mean that to them Buddhist Shintoism Hinduism or any other religion you know would be pagans so whatever definition they gave to the Negroes at that time was their definition not the truth and for those who keep asking, how come if the Negroes were worshipping the Almighty, how come he couldn't save them from slavery? 
you need to also remember that the negro is emulative the negro believes what he is told and we we'll give you a little example imagine if the priest at that time came to announce that people that were menstruating because remember at that time menstruous women were to separate from the family for the period that they should not go to certain places or do certain things knowing how it affects whatever thing they prepared to ward off evil or the army is coming to capture them remember the moment the women started believing that it was wrong for them to be separated they will be breaking those laws so when they broke those laws the armies will strike and they will succeed because the protection has been dissolved or lost because of the disobedience from the menstruous women but that's by the way we want you to understand the scenario and remember today that the same thing they now worship from the slave masters does not save them from the the same muslims if you looked at fulani husband and if you looked at the propaganda of the slave masters media one of the questions you might want to ask yourself is do you think nobody in the american senate or the european parliaments is hearing about the fulani hatsmen or the biafrans or ambazonians they all do but they are behind it that's why you never hear where they talk about stopping the supply chain of the weapons that go to either the nigerian army or boko haram or fulani hatsmen or all those terror groups because they are all the same they already know that their foot soldiers lack humanity and common sense this we are the slave hunters there is no better way to put it so they work together so they know what is happening that's why you can never hear them mention it why not just ask yourself if something like the bbc voa or al jazeera do not report on biafra why not ask yourself why do they not know it we will give you examples when we finish with this clarification and going further it says the hebrews included in the term goim or nations all the tribes of men who had not received the true faith and were not circumcised the christians translated goim by the el gens and imitated the jews in giving the name gentiles to all nations who were not jews nor christians so in civil affairs the denomination was given to all nations who were not romans so going further than it says gentile pertaining to pagans or heathens our question to you is how come it is the slave master that determines who is actually what you need to understand this very well you see they are telling you here that in several terms at that time it just referred to those who were not romans remember if you looked at the bible closely you will see that it was based on the romans it was the romans doing all things and they copied those things they put there from either greek mythology or ancient egyptian script and of course the negro word of life they just bumped through them together some of them you see clearly that they did not know what they were writing so in conclusion you just need to understand that those terms are created by man the slave master then he starts pushing it if we were to ask you in your native language what is jews you probably will not have a word for it because the people didn't know what that was and the idea of somebody being chosen over and above others does not make sense even to the negroes because if you looked at when they brought whatever they brought the golden calf the negroes rejected them and told them that this doesn't make sense for example some of them wondered how there could be an image of the creator of heaven and earth when nobody has ever seen it before whereas the slave master who has no idea what the creator of heaven and earth was they were just physical beings while the negroes were spiritual beings this is exactly how they put them which we shall look at in a subsequent video so the important thing to realize is that the term jews at that time simply meant those that practiced judaism that's ideally what it will mean but before we go further with it let's just look at some other things from the book we referenced earlier our interest here is for you to see exactly how things change for example you have seen how the slave master came up with the aborigine and indian narrative in the next few years if he succeeds in selling that the next generation will grow up believing that they were aborigines 
they will never remember this anymore and that's exactly what the slave master is playing at and then he will become a saint remember most people especially negroes are waking up today to the fact that they have been deceived with the slave master's religions but the slave master is a subtle beast and that's why he came up with his aborigine and indian narrative which we are going to look at a little bit here from the book we referenced earlier please remember that some of the comments on the channel when we reply to them they are actually censored by youtube so you need to understand that and go do your own research the essence of this whole thing is for you to go and look for these materials and study them yourself rise above the fact that the negro listens to whatever he is told somebody will read something see it clearly but wants to believe another thing which we are going to show you that it didn't start today anyway but then you see from the book we referenced earlier that it gives us a breakdown of all the races of man and here it tells us that the african race has a jet black complexion woolly hair flat noses prominent chins and thick lips this race includes the negroes of africa but then it says the american or indian race has a copper color coarse straight black hair high cheekbones sunken eyes and stout masculine limbs this race includes all the indians dispersed over the american continent except the eskimos but you see today the negroes are now being labeled or tagged as aborigine or indian so you see how ludicrous that can be when you look at the historical records so here it gives us a historical table of the states in the united states and it says the first 13 states are those which united in declaring their independence and are called the 13 original states the remainder are placed in the order in which they were admitted into the union so now the negroes are telling us that they, they were aborigine so we're going to show you that that is not only a lie but a slave master engineered fraud so you see he mentions virginia and jamestown that it became a settlement for the english in 1607 so you see that apparently soon after the english settled there they brought in the negro slaves around 1619 but remember there were some negroes already there the ones that came with them from europe freed from europe and came to help them fight the indians this is something they will not tell you unless you go read it yourself they used the negroes in military and as sex slaves by the arabs and of course in their plantations which we shall continue to show you and if you can make out time to study things yourself nobody will come and be telling you book crap imagine somebody like then perhaps younger than your own children telling you that slavery was employment and that you should stop using the term slavery that should tell you right there that he's working for the slave master that alone should tell you what they are trying to do but then it goes further to give us all the states and all that but you have to remember that the countries represented there still own the united states till tomorrow morning so contrary to what you might be thinking and while the negroes are minorities there their populations are not allowed to count anywhere be it in sub-saharan africa or in the americas or in europe and if you notice even in the middle east their population keeps shrinking but they don't sit back and ask themselves why and that's one of the biggest challenges of the negroes they don't ask how what is going on what can we change they just keep living and then any appellation they bring tomorrow in the next 20 years remember when they changed to african-american it was the same argument it was colored previously it used to be negroes whatever terms they choose to bring they just find a way to smuggle it in and you'll see people will buy into it so here you see the presidents but we're interested in number five james monroe and it was between 1817 and 1825 and then the interest here is for you to remember that it was from him that the capital of liberia got its name from remember it was under him that Mon monrovia came into existence as the capital of liberia which was where they resettled some freed negroes that fought on the side of the establishment at that time they were first sent to nova scotia in canada before they now went to liberia 
our interest in showing you this is for you to see but the aboriginal wannabes we want you to believe that indians were shipped from canada or from the united states to liberia in 1821 but we not tell you how they got there before 1821 we not tell you about the negroes that came from europe to help them fight the indians you need to understand their technique very well all the slave master is doing is to run away from the fact that he was a man still that's all so that's what they are doing and remember they do it together with the arabs if people like malcolm x knew that it was the muslims that actually did the capturing in what was negro land and guinea and sold to the christians and jews do you think he would have ever become a muslim the answer would be no but at that time information flow was not clear all they knew was that it was their people selling themselves that's all they knew and then some of them realized that it was a war but they never knew who made the wars and how it was done but today at least all you need to look at to understand the synergy look at Biafra look at Ambazonia and ask yourself how come things like Amnesty International things like VOA things like Al Jazeera they are all together they don't report about them the killings are going on they pretend not to see and if you notice initially when Fulani headsmen started their massacres they were reporting them then they changed their name from Fulani headsmen to just headsmen to remove the Fulani there then after that they decided to change it to bandits now you need to understand that in those spaces where they are committing these atrocities they are not designated terrorists but if you ask for freedom you are designated a terrorist that's the same game they have been playing our interest is for you to open your eyes and look at it it will be very clear to you all you need to do is open your eyes and look at it without bias identify who the hood negroes are and then you will begin to understand the games they are playing the slave master is never smart but he understands how to use the fools within those spaces and here he gives us the inhabitants of the united states and it says the population of the United States consists of three general classes, visibly whites, Negroes, and Indians. But you see, they, they now want to wipe away the Negroes there, and they are now telling you that Negroes are the same as Indians. But unfortunately, the blind ones are running into the trap. Remember, ultimately, to mean there was nobody like Negroes. So all their labor, the slave labor they used to build the United States, will no longer be remembered because it will just go to Indians. The records will start showing Indians. The same way you look at Egypt today, it used to be where Negroes stayed. Negroes occupied the place, but today they are now history. And if you notice how subtle the slave master is, they have the dead bodies of some old ancient Negro ancestors on display and they make money from it while the Negroes are suffering. You need to understand their game, which we shall continue to show you. All you need to do is look for these old records, read the accounts of the slaves themselves. You will understand what they are saying. Instead of believing what the slave master is saying, the slave master knows that the Negro listens to what he is told. So even if the book is saying something different, the Negro will listen to what you are telling him ahead of what the book is saying, even though he can read. That's one thing you have to bear in mind. So that's why you see that despite all the records showing that the Negroes were different from Indians, the slave master is able to market the concept of Indians and Negroes now being the same. If you notice some of the accounts of old, you will see that at that time they hadn't started calling the place where they were stealing the Negroes from Africa. But then they later changed it to Africa so as to disguise it in such a way that people will not know what was going on and you notice it says the negroes are for the most part descendants of african slaves and are found principally in the southern states which was where the slave trade was more you see it very clearly written then it goes further to say the indians are the descendants of those who occupied the country at the time of its discovery by europeans most of these prefer their own modes of savage life to those of the whites and as the latter have extended their settlements they have removed further and further back into the wilderness and at the present time but a small number of them are found east of the mississippi river 
a census or enumeration of the inhabitants of the United States is taken every 10 years. The following table exhibits the population of the United States according to six enumerations. So you can look at it and see what it says. And a little look at Africa, it tells us that Ashanti is the most powerful, civilized and commercial kingdom in the western part of Africa. The capital is Kumasi. Now if you check old maps of Africa, you will see Ashanti there. So that should tell you what may be going on. Remember, the Ashantis are not Negroes. You need to bear that in mind. And then you see further down, it tells us about Dahomey and it says, it's a populous and fertile kingdom inhabited by a savage, ferocious and warlike people. The capital is Abomi, which is merely a large collection of huts. So now if you look at it, you see that it looks more like a Fulani Ruga than anything else. And remember, they were the biggest slave hunters. All those ones that were very brutal in slave hunting, the slave master was able to partition them and share them amongst themselves. That's why you see that Dahomey is no longer there today. But then you have things that replaced it. But that's a different video altogether. That's why we want you to see who the enemies within are. You need to understand it very well. And further down it says Benin is scarcely known to Europeans. But it is represented as a fertile and well watered country. And said to be inhabited by an industrious and humane people. The capital is Benin. So you see, that will tell you some of the places where they got the slaves from. Remember, the Igbo parts and all the area around there were under the Benin Kingdom, as it were. That's how they designated them at that time, which is subject of a different video altogether. Then it goes further to tell us that the coast of Guinea is divided into the Green, the Ivory and the Gold Coast, each portion being named from its principal article of commerce. There are a number of European settlements or factories on the Gold Coast established for the purpose of trading with the natives for gold dust. Cape Coast Castle belongs to the British, Elmina to the Dutch and Christianburg to the Danes. So you see the slave hunting countries, we are well represented. What Professor Gates and the Aborigines wannabes are trying to tell us is that the, the British, the Dutch and the Danes and the French and all the other countries that were involved in the slave trade could have built a fort just to transport 350,000 people over 400 years. Does that really make sense to you? Now ask yourself how did they get the slaves to those places? They were capturing them from the slave coast which is a subject of a different video anyway but then our interest is for you to see who owned what. So as the United States is it is still a plantation. It belongs to these other countries. But then, when we look at the economics of this whole thing, you will understand how they sustain it. And if you really want to understand that the Negroes are still slaves, no matter how you label it or tag it, you have to go research Marcos Gavi and what and what happened when he planned a movement that will ultimately see Negroes move back to Africa and build it the way they want. Now, one of the fears of the slave master is unity of Negroes. They are so much afraid of it. That's why you see things like Biafra and Bazonia are not being supported by the slave masters. And they use their foot soldiers, the same slave hunting partners, to destroy any such thing. So the goal is to make sure that the Negroes remain slaves forever. And they have to rejig and remodel it at every moment in time so that people may not know or see unless you go back and look at history look at the facts so that you understand where they are going so here you see lower guinea and it says lower guinea comprises biafra luango congo angola and benguela it is an extensive fertile and populous country the natives are rude and barbarous and extremely stupid so you see how they classify you the moment you don't agree with what they are saying the reason things like Biafra and Ambazonia are not allowed to stand is because their food soldiers, their slave hunting partners are being used to ensure that. Now think about it. Have you ever heard them talk about cutting off weapon supply to Boko Haram? The answer will be no. That's because they are benefiting from it. It helps them 
put the population of the Negroes and other blacks in check as well. Because like we told you, they are foot soldiers, they lack humanity, they lack common sense. So again, in terms of religion, let us reference West African countries and peoples, British and native, with the requirements necessary for establishing that self-government recommended by the Committee of the House of Commons, 1855. And this was by James Africanus B. Houghton, medical doctor, and published in 1868. And remember, it says it's a vindication of the African race. So, it tells us that, and here it tells us that the religion of the Igbos is Judaism intermixed with numerous pagan rites and ceremonies. They believe in the existence of one almighty, omnipotent, omnipresent being whom they worship as such and regard as the omniscient God who concerns himself with the affairs of man. He is known by the name of Chuku, contracted sometimes into Chi. They also admit the existence of another God or a superior being who in one part of the country is called Orisa and in another Chuku Okike or God the Creator or the Supreme God, thus showing that the nation believes in the division of the Godhead, which is a lie in two beings, each equal in power and influence, yet differing in the Godhead, but the existence of a third person does not seem to be admitted or known by them. So now you see something they copied, they are now claiming to be the owners. Now if you check very well, you will see that things like Trinity are mere conjectures, because first, nobody has seen the Almighty before, so there is no way you can know what could have happened there, and secondly, there is no way somebody can tell you that there are three gods in one. It doesn't make sense. All they try to do is to make the narrative convoluted and then use it to deceive everybody. If you notice, there is no reason to have brought their religion to the Igbos if they were already practicing Judaism before they came. And another question you need to understand very well is they are coming now with Islam because they had it planned that unless the Negroes are Islamized, they easily abandon Christianity in preference for their original way of life. Now, today, people are waking up, but then they are busy using their foot soldiers to propagate Islam. So, let's look at some historical perspectives. Do you remember when we say we prefer materials published before 1950? Do you also remember some people who say the books are too old? and should be discarded. And a little explanation of why we believe the thoughts of eyewitnesses would be closer to the truth than mere conjectures. So can we get you to imagine if someone like Equian Olod was alive today and instead of writing the British Parliament on behalf of his brothers would be saying he is not African like you see the so-called African Americans do today. Remember, while the slave master is coming there to milk the place, because that's where the action is, they are busy denying being from there. Not because they are not intelligent enough, but because the slave master has demonized the place and they forget to ask the slave master, if there is nothing there, why are you there? Like Malcolm did ask, if there was nothing good about Africa, the slave master would not be interested in it. The question becomes, how come the slave master is always there, stealing there, destroying the place, but still the so-called African Americans are more interested in denying where they are from? And please remember, if they floated a movement to go back to Africa today, the slave master will sabotage it. He will not allow that. Because if they were willing to allow the Negroes go back to wherever they chose to, things like Biafra and Ambazonia, wouldn't be sabotaged by the slave masters and their foot soldiers because they understand that if the Negroes become free, they can build their own civilization. They can develop their place the way they want. If you looked at a place like Nigeria, for example, it's controlled by the Fulanese. Now you see that they build roads outside Nigeria, do everything outside Nigeria because of their hatred for the Negroes and other groups. Remember, that's the whole game they are doing which we shall one of these days show you here how the money flows and how their relationship with the slave master works. You will see it very clearly. 
and when they take any action you can actually predict what they will do because like we told you believe it or not the slave master and his foot soldiers they are never smart it's just that the foot soldiers lack humanity and common sense that's all why not ask yourself how any sensible person would take guns and bullets pay very dearly for them and be using it to kill his siblings and say oh they are my brothers no sensible person can do that so if you looked at it from let's say from a nigerian point of view they are busy creating divisions killing people creating orphans trying to force people to migrate to europe through the desert or the ocean but then they will rather buy weapons than providing food to the people so when you look at it you think everyone there are fools everyone there is brainless whereas it's only a particular group that are doing all these things at least you saw the sultan tell you that boko haram is god's way of punishing people for their sins that should tell you who they are so are you telling us then that somebody who believes that it is god's way of punishing nigerians will be against boko haram the answer will be no that explains why they don't believe it's a terrorist group but if you ask for freedom you become a terrorist so the only problem here is because the negroes are never together that's why but then let's just move forward so imagine also if Otobakugano was alive today he too would be saying i am not african and if phyllis whitley was also alive today she would equally be saying she is not african now remember these people at that time wrote the british parliament complaining about the way and manner their siblings back in what was negro land and guinea were being treated they condemned the slave trade but compare it with the so-called african americans today if they hear that people are massacred in sub-saharan africa because of the slave masters wizardry in propaganda they will say oh no we're not africans africans are killing themselves because they believe the slave master they have never taken time to ask themselves how did the slave trade last for 400 years what did people say what did people do who condemned it who supported it that way when they begin to ask such questions they will begin to understand what could have transpired although we know that the slave master never sleeps that's why he went to concoct this latest aborigine and indian narrative which you are going to see how he will sell it he is a master in that now if you notice those that are buying into it they are not buying into it because there is anything their benefit but just because the negro listens to what he is told they have told them oh you are now aborigine as if they are going to pay them if you notice the narrative does not mention the slave master anywhere so he remains a catalyst a catalyst that remains unchanged after causing a serious chemical reaction that's who the slave master is so to better understand what we meant by if a queen that was alive today let us reference the interesting narrative of the life of Olo de Quiano, Augustus Vasa, the African, written by himself, and this was published 1794. First, we see his picture. He has the woolly hair. But then, the aboriginal wannabes keep showing us Indians with their long hair as the Negroes. Now, remember, it doesn't matter how you twist it, the truth remains the truth, even if no one believes it there is no way the negroes would have straight hair it's impossible those people pictures that you see then and um young pharaoh showing you are products of the indian slave master and the negro slave woman that's how they got those ones with dark shades of skin and if you want to believe the nonsense of how christopher columbus wrote in his diary that he saw people with copper color copper color is not the color of the negroes you can talk about the mulattoes you can talk about the moors you can talk about the arabs but certainly not the negroes even though they in some places they refer to some negroes as having copper color this is just based on semantics there is no way anybody can tell you that a straight haired indian even from the gate and physique the negro does not look the same as the indian but then the slave master is obviously behind the indian and aboriginal narrative so you see him he has his woolly hair but then our interest is to show you what he told the british parliament at that time 
So first you see where he says that an invidious falsehood having appeared in the oracle of 25th and the star of 27th of April 1792 with a view to hurt my character and to discredit and prevent the sale of my narrative asserting that I was born in the Danish island of Santa Cruz in the West Indies. It is necessary that in this edition I should take notice thereof and it is only needful for me to appeal to those numerous and respectable persons of character who knew me when I first arrived in England and could speak no language but that of Africa. Under this appeal, I now offer this edition of my narrative to the candid reader and to the friends of humanity, hoping it may still be the means in its measure of showing the enormous cruelties practiced on my feeble brethren and strengthening the generous emulation now prevailing in this country to put a speedy end to a traffic both cruel and unjust edinburgh june 1792 so imagine if equiano was alive today and the reasons like some of the so-called african americans he will be writing the parliament to complain that they are saying he's african when he is not even when he's seeing his siblings being killed now remember the slave master is subtle he has deceived the so-called african americans that they were sold by their siblings now if you notice no african american knows that there is a difference between the negroes and the hamites or negroids or negritos or arabs or barbers tuaregs hotting tots pygmies name it that are in africa so they keep talking africa without even realizing that africa was not the name of the place when the slave trade was going on the, the slaves were captured from what was negro land and guinea between them that's how it was done and if you remember we had shown you from different references that the place used to be called other one side was ethiopia one side was libya remember at some point they came up with the african name and one of the things you have to remember about the negro is that everything about him is controlled by the slave master so there is no name he coined for himself it is the slave master giving him a name and that's why they insist on things like countries like nigeria you can't break it they won't want you to break it because that will allow you give yourself a name however when you look at it you will think that the slave master is super powerful or super smart without his brainless foot soldiers there is nothing sensible the slave master can do so you see how he pretends not to see the same slave master will provide the weapons with which the foot soldiers kill people for example we all know that the fulanese do not manufacture anything they just rear cattle so based on that they do not have any products that can compete with the slave master's products so their duty is to prevent the Negroes from developing anything on their own. That's their duty. If you check businesses and everything, when the Fulanese are in power, they will make sure that all businesses are crumbled so that the slave master can be feeding everybody. So when the slave master is feeding you, there is no way you can develop. That's the game. It doesn't change, which you can see in that region now. At least the mere fact that the Sultan will tell you that Boko Haram or Fulani Hatsmen as it were is God's way of punishing Nigerians for their sins should tell you who you are dealing with. So the idea that you are supporting one Nigeria and then there is Boko Haram you are crying over it at the loss of life and somebody else is telling you it's God's way of punishing people for their sins. Who has sinned more than the slave master? You see why some so called African Americans and the awoken people as well keep saying the negroes have to give up this god idea that's what everyone uses to deceive them and moreover the negroes actually abandoned the creator of heaven and earth if you remember very well they left whatever they were communing with because it wasn't worship you see in prayer you are like a beggar but in the real negro way of life they commune with the spirit which was the creator of heaven and earth they didn't have to worship in worship you are begging just imagine sending your child to school giving him all the money and all the things he needed to be in school so before he buys food he calls you to ask that you bless the food he has bought before he eats it he calls you to do this 
before he does this he calls you to do that whereas in the original negro way of life before they eat the best thing they do the way they did theirs was to throw a little of those food if it is wine or drink they pour libation that's how they lived they didn't live by this idea of going all night to pray for or to some unknown deity that never answers so you see the difference they didn't have to go on all night they didn't have to do anything that's why the slave master figured to deceive them away from communing with the most high and then coming to worship his uh, golden calves so in Aquinas book we see a long list of those that subscribe to whatever he was saying now remember the difference between today and then was that the moment some people cried out against the slave trade some people stood up they were killed yes a lot of abolitionists were murdered the quakers were killed they were demonized but many stayed strong you can see the number of people that subscribed it's a long list we can't show all of it but for you to understand how serious it was but then you see how a clown comes up today to tell you that slavery was employment which is most unfortunate so going further you see where it says about a poem the dying negro a poem originally published in 1773 perhaps it may not be deemed impertinent here to add that this elegant and pathetic little poem was occasioned as appears by the advertisement prefixed to it by the following incident a black who in a few days before had run away from his master and whatever but our interest is for you to see how it was but then somebody is coming today to tell you his employment now if you still don't believe that Dane Calloway is working 99% for the slave master please put it in the comment section and ask him why he said that slavery was employment that you should stop using the term slavery because what they want to do is to wipe away that slate that's what they have been doing they didn't start it today at least many people never knew that the arabs were the ones that did the hunting that's why for example if the so-called african americans today knew that the bulk of them came from the bite of biafra and benin with the slave ports in badagri and where you call calabar today when you they hear biafra they will turn around when they hear ambazonia they will turn around but that's why the slave master does not talk about it so that they don't get to know if you doubt what we're saying just write your MPs, ask them about those places and see what they will say. Just do it in such a way that you write a number of letters so that you see whether they will respond and what they will say. So let us reference The Dying Negro, a poem and it was published in 1773 and there we are shown that the following poem was occasioned by a fact which had recently happened at the time of its first publication in 1773. A Negro belonging to the captain of a West India man, having agreed to marry a white woman, his fellow servant, in order to effect his purpose, had left his master's house and procured himself to be baptized. But being detected and taken, he was sent on board the captain's vessel then lying in the river where finding no chance of escaping and preferring death to another voyage to america he took an opportunity of shooting himself as soon as his determination is fixed he is supposed to write this epistle to his intended wife so that is the employment that the aborigine wanna be and people like then are telling you because he doesn't understand that the slave trade went beyond the shores of America. For them and the aborigine wannabes, America is heaven. They forgot that there were numerous Negro slaves in Cuba. There were those in Brazil. There were those in places like Jamaica, Haiti, Europe and the Middle East. But he is now telling us that America that was formed in 1770s was now where the slaves were stolen from. He thinks that if you were said to be from the land, it will change your survival position. For some of them, they think that, oh, if they stop them from paying tax, it is something to benefit. They forget that you pay tax when you work. And then it's from the work and earning that you pay the tax. But if you were free and on your own, 
you will determine how you want to work and what you want to do. Not a situation where somebody strangles and strangulates you economically and then you are thinking of the tax rebate. Remember tax rebate is for those that are employed. What about those that are unemployed? What about those that are living in the ghettos? What about those that are suffering? No food to eat, no job, no roof over their head. You see that the aboriginal wannabes, they are very myopic. They can't see the big picture. Let us also reference the education of the Negro prior to 1861, a history of the education of the colored people of the United States from the beginning of slavery to the Civil War by Carter G. Woodson, PhD, Harvard, and this was published in 1915. And there we are shown that, and in the introduction it says, brought from the African wilds to constitute the laboring class of a pioneering society in the New World. The hidden slaves had to be trained to meet the needs of their environment. It required little argument to convince intelligent masters that slaves who had some conception of modern civilization and understood the language of their owners would be more valuable than rude men with whom one could not communicate. The questions, however, as to exactly what kind of training these Negroes should have and how far it should go where to the white race then as much a matter of perplexity as they are now so our interest and our question for you here is why do you think the aboriginal wannabes are more interested in their identity than in freedom in liberty remember if they were asking for something like reparation it would be more understandable than talking about being aboriginal Remember also that they deny that the slave trade never happened. Even when you have the testimonies there, like the Elmina or Cape Coast Castles, like the records, all the documents, they are denying all of them simply because they know that the Negro listens to what he is told. Not what he can read, not even his experience. Just tell him what you want him to believe. And if you can add God to it, that's the done deal. He's, he believes you. That's just one thing you have to bear in mind. And that's one trick the slave master plays. Let us also reference thoughts and sentiments on the evil and wicked traffic of the slavery and commerce of the human species, humbly submitted to the inhabitants of Great Britain by Otoba Cubano, a native of Africa. So you see how these ones were at that time fighting to free their siblings, whereas the ones you have today, because of slave master's propaganda machinery, are now fighting to distance themselves from their suffering brothers. Now remember, it's a different thing if they said, oh, we don't have the power to talk about this as against, oh, we're not from Africa, we're aborigines, the slave trade didn't happen. They also forget that in their claims, there are two sides to it. The victims are not only on one side. The victims in sub-Saharan Africa and the victims that were whose own forefathers were captured so you can't stop us from talking about it, even if you chose not to talk about it. So you see some of them coming here to tell us, face your own, leave us. They forget that if we had, even if it was one of our siblings stolen, we have the right to talk about it. It's not for them to come and tell us not to talk about it, simply because the ones that have been stolen have already been stolen. That's all they want us to believe. Even though you know that most of those that come here to say those things, are not actually Negroes. Those are those paid by the slave masters to come and distract and misinform people. If you notice, some of our responses to some comments don't get published. They are filtered out by YouTube. That should tell you. And this was published in 1786. And we hope you noticed that in both Equiano and Otobakugano, they all quoted God or Lord of God. And this one said, He that stealeth a man and sell it him, or make it merchandise of him, or if he be found in his hand, then that thief shall die, Lord of God. Now remember, the reason they are saying all this is because the slave hunters, the Europeans, the Arabs, were actually capturing the slaves. The idea that you could sell a human being is a lie, and moreover, they put it in the book so that it will become palatable to the Negroes. If the Negroes saw that if in the book, the book condemned 
the slave trade condemned some of the things they considered evil. If you read Leviticus, you will understand what we're saying and why the Negroes accepted the book at all. And this material was published in 1786. But our interest is where it says, But I must own to the shame of my own countrymen that I was first kidnapped and betrayed by some of my own complexion who were the first cause of my exile and slavery. But if there were no buyers, there would be no sellers. So please remember, this is because some of the people that came to do the capturing with the Arabs at that time were actually captured Negroes who were offered freedom to become the army. That's how the army is there today. If you check very well, you will see that it is not the slave master that is actually killing people in a place like Biafra or Ambazonia, but it's being done by people, supposedly they are brothers, but they are not brothers. Even though the guns and bombs and bullets and APCs and all those rubbish are provided by the slave master. So now ordinarily, a child whose parents have been murdered by these brainless foot soldiers will be thinking that it is people like me, they are my brothers that actually killed my parents without knowing that they, these are the barbers. They are not the same with his siblings. That's one thing you have to understand. If you want to understand it, why would the Fulani be interested in your place when it is not theirs? It's not like they are coming to bring anything good. They are coming to destroy the place. If you doubt what we're saying, look at the houses today, how they have been destroyed. There is no place they go to and it develops the place becomes an eyesore because that's why the slave master rules through them which we will show you before we round up this we know this is not about them directly but we want you to understand the game being played between the slave master and his foot soldiers and he goes further to say so far as i can remember some of the africans in my country keep slaves which they take in war or for debt but those which they keep are well fed and good care taken of them and treated well and as to their clothing they differ according to the custom of the country but i am safe I, I may safely say that all the poverty and misery that any of the inhabitants of africa meet with among themselves is far inferior to those inhospitable regions of misery which they meet with in the West Indies, where their hard-hearted overseers have neither regard to the laws of God nor the life of their fellow men. Our interest in referencing this particular point, even though he was writing to the British conscience at that time because they were the biggest supporters and defendants of the slave trade, which you can see today, they are the biggest supporters of the evil against Biafrans and Ambazonians. You may not understand it, you may doubt it but they are solidly behind it. You see that this individual is saying that his people kept slaves. But our interest is for you to understand the difference. He says they kept slaves, one or two, which are well fed. But then remember, if somebody is keeping slaves, he lives in a hut, he will probably have one or two. They needed to defend this allegation because at that time, the slave master's propaganda machinery was doing its thing. That's where they claimed that these people were slaves before we captured them. This is something you will find if you were to research this thing yourself. Just research it. Remember, these are human beings. Tomorrow, the way the prison system replaced the slave ship today, that's how they will tell you that, oh no, if you were to go to a place like Nigeria where a lot of people are languishing in jail, this is in inhuman conditions. The slave master will be quick to tell you, oh no, it is them doing it to themselves. But he won't tell you that he is the sponsor behind those things. Because his foot soldiers lack humanity and common sense, you will think it's the same people doing it to themselves. We shall look at it in a different video. But our interest is for you to see, when they say they kept slaves, at least he said they were taken care of, and it is nothing compared with what he is saying. Now, what he was calling slaves was not where people will be working and laboring in plantation to produce food or living in touch houses. If you doubt us, ask anyone from the south, south, southeast part of what is Nigeria today. They will tell you there was somebody they said was my late or grandfather's slave. That's all about it. 
it doesn't take away anything from it beyond that this is what they said he was that's just what it is but then this other one that involves killing people in fact if the master died that's the origin of things like autopsy or post-mortem they use it to determine whether to blame the slave for the death or not so sometimes they will kill the slave so if you notice their judiciary it's never based on truth which you have seen in a place like nigeria where somebody gets money deposited in his account and then the person that made the deposit is at home and the one that got the deposit is going to jail because he is a negro you might doubt us but you're gonna be seeing it that's who they are they work with the slave master the legal system is not based on truth it's not based on anything but slave trade that's why you see that the judges wear the hair of the slave master why not ask yourself what has the hair of the slave master got to do with judgment so a woolly haired negro wears a wig that looks like the hair of the slave master that should tell you how he has been conditioned to become like the slave master so he starts acting like the master that's exactly what happened during the slave trade the judiciary in those places are not based on the truth they are based on the slave trade which is purely man's inhumanity to man that was why the slave master created it he never created it for you to get justice he created it for him to determine what you can get these are two different things so here again we see the religious nature of the negro and he says thanks be to god i was delivered from granada and that horrid brutal slavery a gentle man coming to england took me for his servant and brought me away where i soon found my situation become more agreeable after coming to england and seeing others write and read i had a strong desire to learn and getting what assistance i could i applied myself to learn reading and writing which soon became my recreation pleasure and delight and when my master perceived that i could write some he sent me to a proper school for that purpose to learn since i have endeavored to improve my mind in writing and have sought to get all the intelligence i could but those are not our interest our interest is for you to see the religious nature of the negro the question would have been where was this god before he was captured where was this god when he was shipped across the ocean through the middle passage where was this god before he was rescued by another man but again another lesson to be learned here is the fact that it is wrong to say that it is all europeans or all americans or all arabs or all fulanese because there were some of them that were human there were some of them that actually wanted the slave trade to end like yesterday for example there are some of them today that will want biafra to be free some of them will want ambazonia to be free but unfortunately the slave master is a subtle beast so he will muzzle the press that's why you see that things like the bbc cnn all those things when you hear trump say they are fake news you might think he doesn't know what he's talking about even though he too cannot talk about those things because the slave master knows that in biafra and in ambazonia in those countries in west africa that's where he gets his supplies from you may not understand it but we shall one day break it down for you so to better understand what we mean when we say the negro listens to whatever he is told and you remember they say when an idea gets into the head of a negro to eradicate it can only be by cutting the head off let us reference instructions for the treatment of negroes etc and this was published in 1797 or 1786 was the first print anyways but our interest is for you to see how the negroes believe and listen to what they are told instead of what the records show so we see where it says this company agreed to furnish the spaniards with 4000 negroes the first year but they carried only 1000 to san domingo 500 males and 500 females this first regular importation of slaves into america was in the year 1517 about this time the depopulation of mexico was so great that one half of these blacks were immediately sent to that country so now you see 
This shows you that the Negroes were not Aborigine. And it also shows you that the first slaves were getting there around 1517. But ask an average so-called African American today, they will tell you 1619 because that's what the slave master's propaganda machinery has told them. If you check, you will see their year of return, you see all their rubbish. That's because that's what the slave master is saying. It doesn't matter what the books say. Even if the Almighty comes down to tell them any other thing, if an idea gets into the head of a Negro, to eradicate that idea can only be by cutting the head off. Now remember, the reason that happens is because they don't go to read. They just believe what the master is saying and the slave master understands this perfectly. Remember he wrote all these things. You might be surprised in the next 50 or 100 years, the first slaves would be said to have landed in maybe 1719 or 1800. So they do another year of return for them. You should have imagined how they did Sierra Leone Freetown where they freed some Negro slaves, did Liberia and they are doing Ghana and still people cannot learn to at least ask questions. How come there is even no synergy between the Liberians and of course the so-called African Americans? They don't talk about those. They are more interested in we are not African. Not because they wouldn't have loved to talk about it, but the slave master has used his propaganda to destroy the image of the area in such a way that they don't even know what is there and what is not there. They just believe that it is the people that sold them and everything there is suffering without seeing who is behind that suffering. Remember, if they were to see things like Biafra and Ambazonia, some of them have media houses. They will be able to be reporting things that people may not know about, different from what the slave master is saying. You will hear some of them say, oh no, we prefer a united Nigeria. But then, when killings happen, they don't condemn it. And we shall try to give you a little example with the likes of Trevor Martin, so you understand what we're saying. And going forward, it tells us something in this same book as well. And it says, when this species of slavery was authorized by the Pope, Christian princes thought themselves justified in availing themselves of the indulgence. The infant Henriques of Portugal was the first who employed Negro slaves. Ferdinand the Catholic had a few sent to America upon his own account without asking permission of his holiness. In 1539, a public market was held at Lisbon for the sale of Negroes and townies. We find in a letter from the Chevalier goes upon those are not our interests. Our interest is for you to see how these things happen. But then you see somebody will wake up today and is telling you that it was employment. That's because they are now working to wash it away. You notice that the slave master starts from a very far point from where he plans to go. You see that when he planned this aborigine wannabe narrative, he started with Professor Gates telling you that only 350,000 people were exported over 400 years. You can imagine how ludicrous that was. But at that time, nobody would pick it because nobody knew where they were heading. But as soon as they got that one in, they now came with the aborigine narrative. So that's why you see the aborigine wannabes all telling you that if how can 350,000 now result to our 40 million or 50 million, how many million they are now? But they won't remember to ask where did they get the 350,000 from? Because when an idea gets into the head of a Negro, to eradicate that idea can only be by cutting the head off. So you see how subtle the slave master is. You see how he has sold out Nobe. So when you listen to the likes of Denkalo, where he will also tell you that it's only 350,000 that came from Africa. Now think about it. The slave master in his typical capitalist nature, does he look like somebody who would transport only 350,000 for 400 years and then allow you to talk about it? However, let us reference a tropical dependency, an outline of the ancient history of the Western Sudan with an account of the modern settlement of northern Nigeria by Flora L. Shaw, Lady Lugard, and this was published in 1905. And there we are shown how the slave master rules through his foot soldiers. And it says it was evident that if the policy of ruling through the Fulani was to be maintained, the first duty of the British administration was to provide for the peaceable collection of taxes of the 
and since the conquered emirs had been deprived of the power to raise troops or police in their territories, it was necessary that British force should even be applied in case of need to compel payment. So you see that it was not just about the Fulanese, but they rule through them. That's what they've been doing. That's the same thing they do today. So the same way the Fulanese cascade that same system down, so they place somebody in your community, you would think he's your sibling or your brother, then they will be ruling through him or her. You would think he's your brother when he is actually not. He might actually be a Fulani. This is well planned and thought out game that they have been playing. This is why you never hear the slave master, despite the killings, to say, oh, we impose an arms embargo on Nigeria or on Cameroon. They don't talk about it. The only times they talked about it was when a Negro was in power because they wanted him out by all means possible, which they succeeded in 2015. So our challenge to you is don't believe us, research things yourself. Follow what the slave master is doing, follow his news and you will see how his lies are so obvious, especially the BBC. Again, if you remember when they claimed that the Fulanese were also sold, so you notice why the so-called African Americans would say, oh, some African chiefs didn't want the slave trade to stop. So here you see where it says, the position of the Fulani chiefs was, however, in the first instance, profoundly modified by a condition which was of the very essence of British administration. A large part of their revenue had consisted of tributes paid in slaves and in some cases of the tithe levied on the produce of slave raids which they conducted either in person or by the medium of the commander of their troops. But you notice that the so-called African Americans, not all of them but the aboriginal wannabes, want us to believe that the slaves were captured but not sold anywhere. They were just captured and kept in the place of the Sultan or in northern Nigeria but not shipped anywhere. Even when we see Elmina or Cape Coast Castle there, we see Gori Island, we see all those footprints of the slave trade in Calabar, in the Bight of Biafra and in Badagri, in the Bight of Benin. But they still want us to believe that the slave trade didn't happen. So you see how unfortunate it is, simply because the slave master knows that the Negro listens to whatever he is told, as against the facts. So you see that some so-called African Americans believe the lie already that they are aborigine, even when there is no benefit whatsoever. They were started adorning themselves with Indian regalia and clothes and all that forgetting that the Indians also enslaved the Negroes. Let us also reference Colonial Office Annual Report on Nigeria for the year 1948 and this was published 1949 and there we are shown that the German colony of the Cameroons was conquered by French and British forces in the First World War between 1914 and 1916, Germany renounced her rights to the colony by the Treaty of Versailles and in 1922 a portion of the colony was assigned to the United Kingdom to be administered under League of Nations mandate. The British Cameroons consists of two narrow strips of territory on Nigeria's eastern borders with a gap between them on either side of the Benue River. The total area is some whatever, but our interest is for you to see when you are talking about world war, you will see Negroes going elsewhere to be fighting and dying while the people are busy sharing the land. So you see how the Ambazonia became British possession. It used to belong to the Germans. So that's why you see that their media does not report anything about those places. They know their foot soldiers lack both humanity and common sense. Why not sit back and ask yourself how somebody can tell you you are brothers, but he is massacring you with brutal terror all over him, killing everybody he can, starving people, destroying businesses, and still turn around to tell you you are brothers. So the slave master believes that their full and foot soldiers can do it better. That's why you see them protecting them with their propaganda, even though they go behind to write how foolish they are. But like we told you, you notice that the whole sultan was telling people that Boko Haram is God's way of punishing Nigeria for their sins. So you see some of those things because they all know that if you put God to anything, the Negro will believe you. 
how can God be punishing people when it is human beings that are making the bombs and guns? Does God not have his own power to punish who he wants instead of using people who lack humanity and common sense to do it? The opposite page, you see that in 1914, it was the formal inauguration of colony and protectorate of Nigeria and then the invasion of Cameroon by Nigerian troops on outbreak of war with Germany. But then, remember very well that they claimed that it was an amalgamation in 1914, all because Lugard wrote something like that, whereas the amalgamation was about the colonial office and the business office bringing them together, not necessarily the protectorate as it were, because Lagos, for example, was a colony and it was not part of Nigeria until 1907. But then nobody talks about those. They will keep telling you north and south because they know that the Negro listens to whatever he's told. But our interest is for you to see some of the things that had happened in the area. And then let's look at their foot soldiers before we round up. Here we see that the infiltration of the Fulani people into northern Nigeria probably began on a large scale in the 13th century, which was about the same time the slave trade started in 1434. So you understand it. And remember, they were probably the Moors, but their names were changed so that people won't know. Our interest is to show you, and one test you can do is to ask any Nigerian. All they will tell you is that, no, the Fulanese came in 1904 when they, they stole Hausa land and created their Sokoto Caliphate. Now the question becomes, if they arrived in 1904, how could they have created a caliphate the same time they arrived? Wouldn't they conquer the place before they create their caliphate? Like today, are you going to say maybe when they conquer the southeast and south south part of Nigeria today, are you going to say they conquered it then or now that they started coming in gradually through their own strand of Islam? That's the thing. So here he tells us further that whilst many settled in the towns and intermarried with the house population, others have retained until the present time both their pastoral habits and the purity of their racial characteristics. A quarrel with the pagan king of Gobert led in 1802 to the initiation of a religious war on the part of the Muslim Fulani under the leadership of a sheikh named Othman Danfodio. Out of this war grew the Fulani Empire, extending over the emirates of Kasina Kanu, Zaria, Hadeja, Damawa, whatever. But our interest is to show you when they arrived. And remember, they come in first as if they have no bad intentions, but because that's who they are, as soon as the numbers increase, they will massacre everybody and take over. They have that taste to conquer and they enjoy wars and killing people. That's all. And to further see how subtle the slave master is, here is what he says. The tribes of what is now southeastern Nigeria have little or no known early history prior to the British occupation, with the exception of certain of the coastal peoples who were long known as keen and enterprising traders. Since the establishment of the protectorate, however, the rapid spread of education has brought great changes in a number of directions, and both the Igbos and the less numerous Ibibos now exercise an important influence on the social economic and political life of Nigeria. Now remember, the reason they are telling you they have no history. These were the same people they were capturing and selling as slaves. But they know that if they were to write their history very well, they were going to talk about the slaves they captured. Here again is our interest. It mentions that the discovery of America and the establishment of Spanish colonies in the West Indies led to a steadily increasing demand for Negro slaves and a cutthroat competition between the maritime nations to participate in and to oust each other from the lucrative business of supply. The first Englishman to engage in this traffic was Sir John Hawkins, but he was followed by many others who gained in the rough and tumble of a hazardous trade much of that experience of ships and the sea, which was eventually to prove the salvation of England when the long struggle with Spain moved to its climax in the later years of the 16th century. So clearly were the benefits of the slave trade to the growth of a prosperous and powerful merchant marine realized by the professional seamen that long after when the cause of abolition began to raise its head, 
the Admiralty was amongst the foremost opponents on the grounds of the serious blow which would be dealt thereby to England's essential reserve of trained seamen. But our interest is for you to see how they defended the slave trade. If you notice the Fulanese were against stopping it, even the British that they claimed stopped it, he, they remodeled it. They didn't actually stop it the way you would imagine. And you notice that they are the ones behind the enslavement of Biafra and Ambazonia today because they own those areas. So our interest is for you to at least see the hypocrisy in them and then you will wake up to a point where you will be able to predict every of their move even before they make them and identify all their lies even before they tell them. And it goes further to tell us that the trade in slaves led to the ships of all nations acquiring familiarity with the numerous river mouths between Lagos and Calabar. Little was known of the interior, however, until the beginning of the 19th century, and in particular, the source and direction of the Great River, which was widely reputed to flow across the continent of Africa, was a complete mystery. Our interest is for you to remember that these same people talking about not knowing anything about the interior were slave hunters. Drake was a slave hunter, Francis Drake. So if you remember all those things and they are not telling you that they know nothing about the interior, that should tell you that they are lying. Above all, they have survey plans of the area. They have every point surveyed. If you read early accounts of 17 titles, you will see where they were documented. So they were deliberately writing all this so that you don't know that they did this. Remember, their foot soldiers lack humanity, they lack common sense. So they obviously understood that if they wrote whatever they liked, their foot soldiers will not even see them, let alone realize that they have lied against them. So today, anyone that reads the history will see that it is the Fulanese, the Arabs, the Babas, the Tuaregs, the Ashantis that did the slave hunting for them. But then they will appear like they are innocent, whereas they are actually the biggest culprits. And here he tells us that the Fulani were aliens and the abuses of their later rule had left them with no deep-seated sympathy amongst the subject populations. First Kanu and then Sokoto were defeated and occupied. The desert tribes submitted and the Fulani emirs themselves accepted the relatively easy terms of the conquerors and came formally under British protection. The terms included the abolition of slave raiding and the recognition of British suzerainty, coupled with an assurance that the Mohammedan region, religion and the existing system of law would not be interfered with. So our interest is to show you what happened. It's after they refused to stop slave raiding, the British invaded and stopped them. But still, after colonialism technically ended, the same British went back to Sokoto to hand them back the power, which is what they are still doing till today. So you see how subtle the slave master can be. Now, don't believe what we're saying. We don't even want you to believe it. We want you to go and research things for yourself and monitor what things are going on there. But whatever be the case, here we come to the end of this edition of The Enemies Within, a reply part one. We thank you very much for listening and we encourage you to find time to conduct your own research or at least look for the materials referenced and study them yourself. Don't just listen to what people are saying. Try to check them out. Find out if they are true at least to a large extent instead of just believing whatever they are saying. The slave master is a liar and he knows that the Negro listens to what he is saying. That's why he lies brazenly. He can wake up and tell you today that you are no longer from here, you are from there. Certainly some people will believe him. Thank you once again for listening. Peace.